Great. Um, okay, so we will uh, we'll get started here. So thanks everybody for coming. Um, we'll do uh, you know at least some introductions briefly along the way, but uh, we got a full house. So if we went around and did even thirty seconds of introducing everybody, we would we would run pretty low on time pretty fast. So let's let's just jump into it. Um, uh, I'm Aaron Shaw. I'm a professor at Northwestern and one of the faculty members of the Community Data Science Collective. Um, and I'm really excited that you're all here because this means that you're interested in finding out more about our group, uh, about possibly applying to one of the programs that uh, people are affiliated with our group from. Uh, and that's fantastic. Um, and we've done a few of these uh, Q&A sessions, information sessions now over the last few years. Um, and it, I could say this co confidently that odds are the people who will be a part of the group next year are here today because somehow the folks who seem to find us uh, are the ones who want to come want to come work with us and who and who uh, seem to have the a great a great set of skills and background and training and experiences and et cetera to bring to the group. So um, welcome. We're gonna do uh, we've got a short, set of slides um, just to help kind of anchor our conversation. Um, so I shared the link to the Etherpad already, and you should be able to see the link to a uh, to a uh, Google Slides deck in there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and if my machine will let me uh, share that. Cool. OK, thank you. Um, all right. So uh, Welcome to the Community Data Science Collective Perspective Graduate Student Q&A session. Um, there are a lot of people in the group. Not all of the current group members are here. You can see another subset of us in that photo uh, on the cover slide there that we took at our annual group meetup slash retreat that was held at Purdue. Uh, let's start off with a little bit more introduction and orientation to the group and, and who we are and what we do. Um, we'll open it up for some Q&A. Um, many of you, uh, or at least some number of you, submitted questions ahead of time, and you will find in that same Etherpad link shared in the chat here um, that at the bottom of that link, uh, the faculty members of the group uh, with uh, ha have like divided up those questions and tried to draft responses uh, to each of them in writing. Um, so, you know, while we're talking or after we're talking during the Q&A, take a look there, see if we answered your questions, see if you're happy with our answers, see if you have more questions, um, and feel free to use the chat for the for Jitsi to post additional questions or you know, raise your hand either while we're talking or during the Q&A itself, and we'll do our best to, to cover what we can. Um, you know, for sort of obvious reasons, some of the questions that you may have are probably more specific to you, your circumstances, your experience, uh, or to one uh, one particular program or faculty member or something like that. Um, as much as possible, uh, we'll try to nudge those kinds of questions into email or follow up afterwards, um, just to try to maximize the benefit that everybody in the room gets from being here together. Um, so, uh, you know, like I said, if you have other questions, even if you're not sure if they would fall into the category that everybody might benefit from, please share them. Uh, let us try to do our best to decide and answer the most general form of the questions. Um, we appreciate the questions and we wanna do our best to answer them. Um, okay, so uh, that'll be the introduction, the orientation and the Q&A. Um, also as part of the introduction and the orientation, we're gonna have a very, very short kind of lightning talk presentations from a few current members of the group about research that's been going on in the group recently. Um, so hopefully you'll get a little bit of a flavor of that. Um, after we're done with those things, we'll shift to uh, breakouts, um, where the idea is that we'll break out based on campus, uh, where current members of the group are located. So we've got folks from Northwestern, Purdue University, University of Washington, and the University of Texas, Austin, here with us today. Um, so we'll have you know, a breakout room per campus. Um, and uh, for the most part, uh, those rooms will have current student members of the group present in them with one very important exception, which is UT Austin, uh, where because Nate Tablentis, who's a professor there, 
uh, is pretty new on the scene there, doesn't have any current students as part of the group who are there. So it'll be Nate in that room. So you should go there if you want to talk more to Nate. Um, highly recommend that. Um, OK, uh, other things to mention, um, just as sort of uh, housekeeping stuff. Um, we owe a huge thank you to Madison Dio, who is a program coordinator working with the group for uh, the last six months or so. Um, Madison helps plan and execute and uh, kind of organize a lot of our events, uh, both more kind of research and group focus like this one, and also some of our more public facing events as well, um, and does it really well. And we're really grateful for that. And so uh, thanks to Madison for helping get us get us going on all of this today. Um, OK. So with that, let's jump in. So what is the Community Data Science Collective? Um, in short, we're an interdisciplinary research group working at multiple campuses. Um, we mostly study online communities, participation, learning, collaboration, collective action. Uh, there's a lot of different kind of phenomena that you can encompass with that, but that's what most of our work touches on in some way, shape, or form. And Mostly, I would say members of the group are using quantitative and or computational methods to do that kind of work. What that looks like varies a lot. Um, and the reason that mostly is there in parentheses is that we also do other kinds of work too. Um, members of the group have done ethnographic studies, interview studies, right? We're not, we're not you know, tied super tightly to any one particular uh, approach of data collection or analysis. Um, and uh, mostly we try to create a uh, an intellectual community um, that can have some shared interests, but all of us have interests and projects that go beyond uh, the sort of overlapping area of the, of the work of the group. And so if you're sitting there asking yourself, well, I'm into this online communities and quantitative computational research thing, but I also like this other thing, uh, don't worry, you're not alone. That just means you're just like the rest of us. Um, in terms of fields and disciplines, a lot of us do social science and or social computing research of some kind or another. Um, we've got a lot, we've got a handful of folks over the years who've done and currently do learning science research. Within the social sciences, I'd say we probably overrepresent communication uh, and organizational research. And within HCI and social computing, um, we do work that looks more like, um, you know, kind of empirical analysis and, uh, you know, rather than some of the other kinds of design research that uh, those of you who are familiar with those domains may have encountered already. Um, but that said, right, what I've tried to set up here is the idea that this is just sort of capturing the central tendency of the group or tendencies of the group. It's not meant to encompass all of it. Um, and there are exceptions and variations uh, to everything that I have said here. Um, Okay, so here's our little faculty page. And uh, what we'll do for this is we'll let each faculty member just kind of introduce themselves very briefly. And you can maybe say a little bit about yourself and the PhD programs that you are connected to um, through which you might recruit students. So Jeremy, why don't you kick it off? We'll just go alphabetically here. Sure. Hi, great to, great to see so many folks here. I, I, yeah, I'm Jeremy Foote. I, I am faculty at, uh, at Purdue University in the Brian Lamb School of Communication. Um, I guess the the things that are maybe relevant in 30 seconds uh, for uh, for folks interested in applying. Uh, we have, I'm affiliated with two different groups at the school, uh, MTS, which is Media, Technology, and Society, and Organizational Communication. Um, and the quick tip that I'll give is that lately we've had uh, an overabundance of folks apply to MTS. And so if you have organizational interest, then probably apply there. Um, my yeah, my own research interest really quickly uh, compared to the group. I guess my tendency is more toward individual type things. I'm interested. I've been working on some field experiments and sort of understanding how individual decisions uh, in online communities are shaped by and shape the the groups that people belong to. All right, I'm uh, noticed that I was next in line. Uh, I'm uh, Benjamin Mako Hill, and uh, my. Um, I'm at the University of Washington uh, in the Seattle campus. Uh, my uh, primary appointment is in the Department of Communication, but I have additional appointments and have in fact advised PhD students in three other different uh, three other um, programs on campus: uh, the Department of Human-Centered Design and Engineering, 
the department of the Paul Allen School of uh, Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, they changed their name. Uh, it's no longer a department promoted uh, and the uh, uh, and the information school. Um, uh, I think that um, I am involved in the um, I'm involved in the admissions process. Uh, uh, in a pretty like I'm actually on the admissions committee for the Department of Communication. Uh, I don't know if this is, uh, the, um, and that it is my primary appointment. So I'd say about half of my students, maybe a little bit more, have been in communication. It is sort of like my primary home. But I'm also involved and have actually admitted students into human centered design and engineering, usually um, or the information school or even computer science. But I think in each of those cases, it's been a situation where it's been sort of like um, uh, advised by. Um, uh, advised by uh, another um, uh, co-advised with a person in, in that department as well. So um, uh, I would say, uh, I don't know, what am, how am I, like my relative different? I think that um, I am very interested in questions of governance. I think other people in the group are as well. Um, I think that I have like a background as a sort of a participant in a bunch of free open source software communities um, and have, uh, I think that I'm that, that's sort of catching on a little more broadly as well within the group. But I think that uh, um, uh, stuff related to like free open source software is a thing that I've done and also work related to learning is something that I've done that other people have done a little bit less of. So uh, that's me. I think uh, Aaron Shaw, you're next. Great. Um, thanks, Mako. Um, let's see. So things I haven't told you about me. Uh, so I've been at Northwestern since about 2012. Um, and most of my research work uh, has my, my PhD is in sociology. Um, and most of the students I work with at Northwestern have come through either the Media Technology and Society program uh, here. Um, which is an interdisciplinary social science program that's mainly uh, kind of facultied by uh, people like me whose appointment is in the communication studies department here. Um, I also work with a number of students in the technology and social behavior program, which is a joint PhD program between the School of Engineering and the Department of Computer Science there and the School of Communication Studies, I mean, the School of Communication and the Department of Communication Studies. Um, so TSB is probably the like most HCI centered PhD program at Northwestern, um, right? We are, our computer science uh, department uh, does not have a sort of HCI track or anything like that. Um, and indeed there's a center for human computer interaction and design, which is joint across the two schools as well, and which is physically located in the communication studies department building. Um, so HCI at Northwestern kind of includes communication studies. And so that's like the part of me that is uh, affiliology. Um, I have had PhD students in social classes. Uh, I've had conversations with them about projects and qualifying exams and things like that. I have not, uh, advised a PhD student in sociology yet. That's not to say it's impossible. It's just to say that if you want to be the first person who does that, make sure you uh, contact me um, because I'd probably have to intervene in the sociology admissions process in some way that I haven't managed to do yet. Um, so uh, stuff that I'm interested in. Let's pass it to Nate. Hi, uh, I'm Nate. Um, Nate Blenice, or I go by Nathan on paper usually. Um, so. I'm a professor at the School of Information at UT Austin. Um, I'm still new here. Uh, I don't have any other courtesy appointments yet. Um, maybe uh, communication is gonna... <clears throat> uh, and yeah, I share a lot of the same interests um, as others in the group. Um, a lot of my work has been about Wikipedia. A lot of my work has been about Reddit. I think the things that make my work a little bit more like distinctive or like sort of my niche within our group is in uh, large scale analyses of uh, online communities, often looking at, you know, groups of them, um, or sometimes we use like sort of an ecological metaphor, thinking about um, information ecosystems and relationships between communities. Um, so some of my work on Reddit tries to understand like, why are there so many uh, subreddits that seem to have similar topics and tries to understand if they are they competing with each other over users or do they sort of each have sort of a complementary role uh, on Reddit. And I think the other area um, is that I'm, you know, that I'm distinct is in um, statistical methods for social science and uh, in trying to come up with like 
more sort of rigorous uh, and also um, potentially more powerful ways of using uh, machine learning, automated classifiers uh, to do measurement in social science. Um, and so that's an area that I have some recent work and that I'm developing. Um, and then other parts of my future work will I'll sort of continue in uh, sort of the information ecosystems vein in various ways. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Uh, any other, I guess I'll hand it off then. Um, yeah, yeah, we can go back yeah. to the um, slides. Thanks, Nate. So uh, so like I said, if you've got questions about any of the things we've said already or questions come, in, come to you shortly, um, you can put them in the chat, you can raise a hand and we'll try to get to folks uh, as soon as we can. We're gonna go back to the, I wanna go back to the slides now cause we're gonna um, segue into talking about uh, some recent research in the group. Okay, so hopefully you can see my slides again. Um, so what kinds of research happened in the CDSC? Um, you just heard some broad characterizations from me and the other faculty folks affiliated with the group, um, but we wanted to give you some more specific examples. So we're gonna, these are gonna be like kind of postcard lightning talk type versions of what are much more in-depth involved, interesting, uh, you know, complicated research projects than could possibly be captured in this amount of time. Um, so we'll turn it over for each one. We're going to turn it over to the uh, member of the group who's led the work uh, in this space. And they'll say a little bit and we'll just ask them to try to keep it to just a minute or two each, um, knowing that you can follow up with them afterwards. So uh, we'll start with, um, uh, whoops, I went in the wrong direction. There we go. We'll start with Zareen and talking about governance capture on Wikipedia. So uh, Zareen, are you ready to go here? Yes, sorry, this is an unupdated slide, but uh, this is a project about um, looking at uh, the capture of a particular language edition on Wikipedia, the Croatian Wikipedia that was taken over by a group of far right nationalists. Um, and we conducted an interview study uh, comparing it to adjacent language editions, such as Serbian Wikipedia, that were not captured. Um, and uh, we developed kind of a theory of why one language edition failed to, um, uh, I guess, failed to defend against these um, disinformation attacks while another language edition largely succeeded. Um, and the answer is related to the way that the uh, different language editions organize their institutions on the on, on on Wikipedia, as well as how um, the degree to which they kept their kind of bu bureaucracy open to uh, new members versus not. Um, and we're c currently working on a follow up study that quantitatively kind of tests this model across um, Wikipedia's three hundred plus language editions. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Zareen. Um, okay, so the next one we have up here is kind of a, a collection of projects focused on misalignment in software communities. And Kaylee Champion, Dr. Kaylee Champion, is going to tell us uh, what that's about. Hey, so if you use the web or a phone, you use free and open source software. And it turns out the maintenance of that free and open source software is not always at the level of quality you might expect given how much we depend on it. So to unpack this problem, to detect it, to measure it, and to understand why it happens, I've done a series of research projects and tried to sort of track down some of those features and factors to consider uh, with this essentially global problem. So that sort of is one point of showing you this slide is that, hey, this is an interesting set of problems that folks in the group work on. The other sort of illustration from this particular slide, which eh, it's not clear, maybe you can't really read it, um, is that I've done this work not only with people at my own institution at University of Washington with Benjamin Mako Hill, but also now I've been able to work together with folks at Northwestern, including So Hyun Wong and um, Matt Ginn and Aaron Shaw to think about how to kind of extend what I've done already into other directions, adding new things. And then we kind of have these collaborative research projects. I last, I think we have maybe three or four at this point that kind of 
kind of blossomed out of um, the initial work that is sort of on this slide already. So I guess the other feature here to think about is how working in a lab like the Community Data Science Collective can let you extend the impact of your work beyond just the immediate sort of institution that you choose a home in um, and think about how that extends the collaboration. In fact, through the CDSC, I've been able to get support to go to, at this point, over two dozen different community gatherings and take this research work that I've spent all this time on now to take it to the hands of practitioners who can put that research work into practice every day, which is um, very, very exciting. And uh, I've been thrilled to be supported in that, in that endeavor. Next. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, Great. Very uh, well, you, well picked text. along all dimensions. So thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, and we can talk more maybe in Q&A if folks want about some of the things that folks in the group are doing to, to try to bring research uh, out of purely academic conversations in various ways uh, as well. Um, okay, for number Alrighty. three here, we've got group sanctions on the Fediverse. Carl, please take it away. Hi, I'm Carl Kalaser. I'm a fifth year PhD student in technology and social behavior at Northwestern. My advice by Aaron. Uh, a lot of my research focuses on decentralized social media platforms like Mastodon. So one of the cool things about these platforms is it's decentralized into a bunch of different servers that each have their own rules and norms and policies and ways of approaching things. They have a lot of autonomy. Um, but one of the downsides of the system, or maybe an upside to be determined, is uh, you can't control what people are doing on other servers. So oftentimes when servers get into conflict with each other, uh, one server will end up blocking, completely blocking another server so that data can't pass between them. Um, and one question that we had was, well, what happens when there were accounts that used to communicate across these servers and that uh, connection was severed? So we looked at uh, a bunch of accounts that had a prior relationship that was severed by what we're calling defederation events. And we're particularly interested in how does this affect activity and toxicity? Uh, so we used some fancy-ish uh, causal inference techniques uh, to find match controls. And what we found was compared to these match controls, uh, the accounts on the initiating server, the server that blocked other servers, uh, did not see any change in activity, but the ones on the block servers did see a, a significant drop in their posting activity post defederation compared to the match controls. Uh, we also looked at toxicity and we did not find any effect here. Cool. Uh, thanks, Carl. And like I said, there's this is not the only uh, Fediverse or decentralized social media project going on. And indeed, there's a subset of us that are meeting right after we're done with this to talk about some new project ideas in that area. Um, More in so, the pipeline. Yeah. Stay tuned. Watch the space, as they say. Um, OK, uh, number four. Uh, we've got narrative persuasion on Reddit. So yeah. Ryan, you're leading this one. Please take it away. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and yeah, I think I'm an example of maybe some of the, the work in the group that's, that's slightly more far afield uh, from like the, the community organizing uh, work that, that others do. But um, yeah, what motivates my research is this question of what communicative mechanisms can help us like bridge divides in online communities. And so uh, one of the ways that I'm, uh, one of the mechanisms that might be able to help bridge divides is, is using storytelling and narrative. So uh, looking at this community on Reddit called Change My View, where people uh, will debate topics and they will invite people to try to change their perspective. Uh, and then they will award symbols to people who uh, successfully uh, are able to change their mind to some degree. And so we're able to kind of look at, ah, these chunks of text uh, were successful at uh, changing somebody's mind to a degree. Um, and so uh, the, the hypothesis that we're uh, testing with this project and working on with, uh, with Jeremy as well uh, here at Purdue uh, is, is testing this relationship between do, do stories uh, help make these posts more persuasive? Do, do they convince more people if there are stories uh, in these um, in these posts? So um, it, it, this project has kind of gotten it's been on hold for a little while for me, uh, but we're we're jumping back into it now. Uh, basically, we've gathered a big chunk of of data from this subreddit, and uh, we've worked on filtering and cleaning it up to be able to then uh, assign, figure out which posts have the these. Uh, we're successful at persuading people. And then uh, we're training a model to be able to uh, uh, identify the small stories in it and to be able to then link those two up and statistically test the relationship between the two. So uh, still ongoing uh, work that we have here. So uh, no results uh, yet about the statistical relationship, done some other related projects qualitatively on this subreddit. Um, but uh, but this is an example of, of some ongoing work of, uh, of looking at some of these online communities from maybe a bit of a different angle. 
Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Um, okay. And thank you again to all four of the folks who shared a little bit about uh, some of the work that you've been doing. Um, like I said, there's a lot more to find out about this work and other work going on in the group, and this is in no way meant to be complete um, or comprehensive uh, or representative in any like statistical sense. It's, but it is representative in sort of a looser sense of the kinds of things that happen in the group. Um, and it captured projects from uh, current or recent uh, graduate student members of the group at all of the campuses. And so uh, that was sort of how we had composed it. So uh, before I stop sharing slides, I just wanted to show you this one as well. So you can learn a lot more about the group, about things going on in the group, about our research, about the people in the group. Um, and there are a few links on uh, this slide, which again, you have access to the slide deck through the chat and through the notes etherpad that we shared. Um, we can share them again. If you've lost it, just let us know in the chat here. Um, and we really encourage you to explore these resources. Um, that's what they're there for. Um, and we're happy to answer questions either, you know, in the next 20 minutes or, or the next 40 minutes or over email or whatever other means you can use to find us, track us down and ask us questions. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing slides. Um, and let's see, I'm waiting for there's my, there's the right, the proper tab. Okay, so more uh, kind of seriously onwards to the Q&A part of the session here. Um, so I've said it several times, if you've got questions, you can raise your hand using the Jitsi interface. You can uh, enter questions directly in the chat here, or you can enter them. Uh, I think ideal would be towards the bottom of the etherpad um, where we've got notes and answers to some questions that were submitted ahead of time. Um, uh, not quite yet. Um, I think we're, uh, we're not quite on schedule, but we were going to spend about 15 or 20 minutes as a full group doing Q&A if folks are interested. I mean, if you, if you don't want to hang out for the Q&A, you're more than welcome to wait in the breakout rooms and somebody will come join you shortly. Let's put it that way. Um, but uh, for those who want to, we can try to field some of the questions that came in already. Um, and then I see we've got one hand up. So uh, if you want, you can you can uh, go for it. Um, Eric, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I guess I have one starting question that um, <clears throat> is probably better addressed as the whole group as opposed to a breakout room, which is, and you, you kind of mentioned that you're having a call after this call to talk about ideas, but what is the sort of pipeline for raising ideas for students who are in different institutions? And how do you sort of forge those connections initially when you're starting to um, start a project across institutions? I guess, could you walk me through that beginning process? Sure, I can take a stab at that. I mean, I think that, uh, so our group, um, despite the fact that we're like, um, distributed across a bunch of different campuses. We actually uh, all get together um, pretty regularly. So that happens, we have a retreat once a year where we all get together and present ideas and give each other feedback on our work. Um, and we actually have weekly meetings as a full group. We usually have like a, like a more of kind of like a housekeeping meeting, uh, which we schedule for usually half an hour, um, which is the whole group once, um, uh, like, like every other week and then usually within campuses. Uh, on the off weeks. And then we have a workshop uh, opportunity where people present um, things. And I think that, uh, you know, some of those, some of the stuff that's presented at the workshop um, and where people get sort of feedback from the whole group ends up being things like, um, uh, like uh, that, that, that's like maybe stuff that's further along where you want feedback about it. But I'd say most of the stuff that gets gets proposed is uh, really just sort of ideas for work, right? Like the outline for a potential project. Um, and then there are other avenues as well. You know, I think that, that we have, um, uh, we all sort of have like, you know, like a, like a group chat channel where we're all sort of on. Um, and I think that in the, the meeting that will be happening after this um, is a thing where someone, uh, you know, had shared something happening in the world and said, oh, this is really interesting. And other people respond and saying, oh, that's cool. I'd love to do research about that. And then people said, who would like to do that? And then we took it to the big group meeting. Um, we said, uh, you know, if anyone's interested, this is basically the plan. And then someone found a time that would work and we're meeting as a result. So I think that there's a bunch of different avenues that we have. Um, uh, I think that we really do in many ways sort of operate like a 
like a, like a single research group, um, just a big one that's distributed a bunch of places. And there's lots of opportunities, the kinds of things that, that, that like a lab would have, um, uh, we have, it just involves, you know, maybe more people, the scheduling is more difficult, um, in some ways, the time zones are a little bit of a problem, but I think that the, 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 the benefits from the sort of like the diversity of, um, people ends up being sort of like really valuable. Cool. Um, looks like Nate want, Nate, you want to speak out too? I mean, uh, you mentioned, you know, that we're having a meeting to like talk immediately after this, or like the person asked the question, mentioned that. And I, I could just like briefly explain, like, I think that meeting came about because there was like a previous sort of conversation. Was it at the retreat? Maybe I wasn't there at the retreat this year, but um, about like, okay, let's do these ideas. But then there was like an event that happened um, where uh, there's like new features coming out on Macedon and that sparked like an interest that was discussed uh, I think first in our just like sh group chat room uh, and then a bunch of people express interest in like studying that. And then now we're having a meeting to sort of uh, talk, it, you know, and, and develop, you know, more concrete ideas about it. So it just kind of happened kind of organically among people who shared an interest in it and them talking about it in any of the various channels that we maintain for having conversations and chatting with each other. or entering surprising strings of characters into the chat. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Uh, any of the faculty uh, want to kind of speak to any of the questions that you provided written responses to or uh, put those to the group? Sure, I'll, I can talk about one of them. Uh, one of the questions that I answered was whether when you're giving a, you know, a lot of times these applications will have a research proposal or a, you know, statement of purpose or things you're interested in and whether you'll be tied to, you know, doing whatever you say you're gonna do uh, for the, the rest of your time as a PhD student. Um, and I'll say the short answer is uh, no. I mean, I think that uh, that's one of the, the nice things about being in the social sciences is that we don't have, you know, a $10 million machine that, you know, now you're a PhD student, you need to be the one that runs that machine the rest of your time here. Uh, there's lots of flexibility in the things that you uh, choose to study and that you do study. And in fact, I think it's very common that people evolve and change their interests. Um, that really what those research statements do is like figure out if there's alignment between your interests and the faculty member's interests and also show that you know that you've been thinking about these things you're sort of aware of the literature and the research in the area and that you have that you're able to come up with cool interesting ideas we don't have one in the Nobody in the queue right now. Um, I'll mention one question that I tried to respond to. For those of you following along in the Etherpad, it's on line 54 and my response starts on line 55. Um, and the specific question is about, I, I don't know who this was. So I, you know, somebody asked like, given that my interests are in this area and that area, my prior experience is over here, uh, which program should I be thinking about? And I think the general form of this question is sort of like how to, you know, each of us mentioned at least two doctoral programs, right? How the heck do you figure out what's right for you? And I think um, this is a this is a tough thing in general about these programs and about finding um, places where the kinds of work you want to do are kind of well aligned with the people who would be there to mentor it and support it, as well as um, with the skills and training that you bring with you and that you need to to do the kind of work that you do given you want to do given your goals um right and so i think there's some triangulation process by which uh you know hopefully in the course of applying to programs reading about programs learning about the kinds of work that have been produced by the faculty and students in particular programs you can get a sense of the kinds of conversations that are happening in these places or the kinds of uh the styles of work that tend to uh, reflect the patterns of any one program or any one lab or any one group, um, or even a discipline or if, you know, uh, an interdiscipline or something like that. Um, 
And I think that, uh, you know, I didn't say this in my written response, but I think a great place to start is by reading recent work that people have been involved with. Um, so, you know, for any of us, you can get the best place to get a sense of what I've been working on is what's come out in the last couple of years or months or whatever. Uh, and if you're trying to figure out if there's stuff that's not represented there, if I'm still interested in a particular area that I worked on five years ago, that's a great thing to ask me in an email, right? Um, or, or if you know you're interested in something that seem that to you seems like it's related, but you're curious if I agree, right? Or what I might make of it, um, send that send that question in email. That's that's definitely something that makes sense to to talk about more over email. But there's sort of no. Uh, no better way to find out what we've been working on than seeing what we've been putting out into the world most recently. And a lot of that shows up on our research group blog and places like that. Um, or the list of publications that Carl just linked to. Thank you. I can speak to uh, one of the questions that um, was asked in advance that I think is like an opportunity to actually highlight a thing that we're relatively that I'm, I'm relatively proud of, and I think our good is good at our group is good at. The question was about like maintaining, um, like how to how to sort of like have impact, how to do research that has impact. And I think that my answer to that, um, which you can read in the in the Etherpad, sort of boils down to like I think that there's no real substitute for building relationships with the places and context where you want the impact to happen. And that happens both on kind of like the front end of the research project in the sense that if you like are aware of and in conversation with the kinds of sort of like communities or organizations or contexts which you are like researching, you're more likely to like ask questions that are going to be useful to them, right? Like sometimes like if, if academic work gets, you know, very involved in conversations with other academics and you ask questions that are like very important theoretical questions questions that don't actually correspond to questions that people outside of academia or those theoretical conversations like really have. Um, and I think that, uh, um, and similarly on the back end, right, there's lots of really great research that could be very impactful, but that like is only read by, by scholars, not the people who are being studied and who might be able to put that work into action. I think one thing that our group um, does, has done very well, I mean, so Kaylee Champion mentioned earlier that she'd given, you know, uh, a dozen talks or so at different, um, uh, oh, two dozen talks uh, <laughs> uh, at, uh, at different, more, more than two dozen talks um, at different um, uh, organizations uh, that correspond to community, the communities that, that Kaylee has studied as part of her work in these like sort of free and open source software communities. Um, and I think that we've built actually a set of like kind of like, like sort of more durable sort of like institutional things within our group to do that. We have a set of, uh, we have this thing called the the Science of Community Dialogue series, which Kaylee has been involved in. We, uh, Kaylee has helped actually lead the organization of a, of a track at FOSSI, which is a free and open source software conference that happens. Um, and I think that what we, we essentially build these like opportunities for for, um, practitioners for groups of people that are the kinds of people that are leaders within the kinds of communities um, or contacts that we study um, uh, to we build relationships with them and we talk about research with them and we talk about problems that they have with them in ways that I think both means that our work is like more likely to have an impact out in the world um, and also it means that our work is I mean like like because people know about it but also in the, because I think that we we ask questions that tend to be sort of connected to those um, to those communities as well. Um, we do other things as well. We have a public blog and there's a bunch of, there's a, the, the, you know, we write up these little explainer documents, a bunch of these things as well. Um, it's the thing that I think uh, distinguishes our group from a lot of other sort of like um, academic groups and I'm very proud of um, proud of that. So thanks for the link um, in the chat to this as well. It's the Science Community Dialogue Series. You can, you can see some recordings of previous events and a sense of the kind of way in which we do that. Ernest, please unmute, go for it. Yeah, thank you. So, sorry, I might not be able to on my video. And um, so um, my initial question was answered, but another question popped to my mind right now. So I was checking some of the schools like uh, University of Austin, um, Austin and um, University of Texas, sorry, in Austin. And I saw that um, one of the requirements is that you should have uh, English proficiency. But because I'm in Nigerian and I'm a native speaker of English, I did not uh, plan to package that in my application. 
So how do I try to clarify that if being a native speaker does not affect you or they say international students are meant to write the English proficiency, does that mean I don't have a chance? Um, I mean, you should follow up with Nate for any details about the UT Austin requirement and how that gets handled there. I think different institutions seem to handle this slightly differently. Um, I was the director of one of the PhD programs here at Northwestern for a few years. So uh, what I observed with that is that if the language of instruction at an institution from which you already hold a degree is English, um, that is usually uh, considered sufficient evidence uh, of English proficiency um, for the purposes of admission. Um, and uh, and I would say that beyond that, um, the details really are more of a case by case thing. So uh, for example, if you wanted to follow up, I would say maybe Nate can help you identify the right person in the PhD programs that he's connected with who could help field that question and make sure that your particular case uh, would work out uh, in a favorable way. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, most of these, most, most of the universities are not in the business of trying to get people who have already got degrees in English demonstrate to demonstrate that they can manage themselves in English. Uh, that's not the, that's not the thing they're trying to yeah. regulate there. So I'll say usually these, usually these rules are actually things that we have no control over. They're like dictated by like sort of like broader institutions within the university. Um, but I think that you could contact any faculty member and they can help uh, um, point you to the place or the administrator who'd be able to help you understand how to navigate those things. So. Thanks for the question, Ernest. Yeah, I just don't know the answer um, off the top of my head. Um, other uh, Q&A questions, anything else showed up in the, in the etherpad or the form while we've been here? Um, while folks are thinking about that, I'll just say if, you know, I've mentioned this a few times, but if you have questions that are about your specific situation or about the particular interests of a faculty member, particular elements of one of the PhD programs or one of the universities, um, please uh, feel free to contact us over email um, or whatever other means you've established contact with any of the members of the group already. Um, you know, we, if we don't know the answer, you know, like Mega said, we'll do our best to help route you to the place that you can find it. Um, there, there was a question in the 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 Etherpad. Oh yeah, Madison uh, pasted it into the. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, Madison. Yeah. Um, how do people raise um, ideas and collaborations? Given that the lab is so spread out geographically, I think we touched on this a little bit. Um, uh, I think that that um, I mean, in some sense, you're looking at it. Uh, um, like uh, we're uh, we uh, we spend no small part of our lives right here in uh, meet.jit.se, so um, uh, Jitsi. Uh, so we, we spend a lot of time in video chats, and I think that uh, that um, uh, that's part of the answer. I think that we we use a bunch of different sort of like online collaboration tools. I think one thing that's kind of like, like a, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we're like, you know, I think this is a thing that people in general have gotten better at. I think that uh, we tend to study like a lot of online communities where people are geographically distributed and are working collaboratively together to do things. Um, and we've take we've learned a lot of things from uh, the those from those online communities. We use we use wikis. We use um, video chat. We use um, a range of different sort of group group chat systems that we've used historically. We use distributed revision control systems like Git. Uh, we use Etherpads to take notes. Um, I think that there's a bunch of these different um, that there's a bunch of these different tools. We probably rely on them more than groups that are co-located for certain kinds of things. Um, and we um, and we and we spend money um, uh, as a group to fly everybody together once a year. Um, so that we can um, spend time together as well, because I think that there are certain things that are hard to do when you're always when you're distributed geographically, and we and we do have some face to face time as well. Um, I think that subsets of us also see each other more often at things like conferences and things as well. So, um, if I become an advisee, uh, 
of a faculty member at CDSC, can I join this collective? Yes, definitely. Um, and many, uh, many people are connected to us in various ways uh, without being advisees. Um, you know, in some cases, we just have our respective individual and social and professional networks and people in those orbits wind up hanging out with the group at various places and times. Um, in other cases, uh, you know, you can check out on that people page of our wiki. Um, there are folks who have sort of been repeat offenders in that regard and who uh, have engaged with the group in more sustained ways, whether project-based collaborations, collaborative grants, co-hosting or sponsoring events, um, and, you know, or just participating in events repeatedly. And, and we really try to in, find ways to ensure that the boundaries of the group are porous. Right, so that means that doctoral admissions is not the only way that people find us or get involved with us or become part of our world. Uh, but um, you know, we really try to like, like Mako was saying, a lot of the groups that we study are these kinds of open collectives online that use remote collaboration tools to work together to do interesting things, and we do our best to try to uh, embrace some of the possibilities of that as well. So. Um, yeah, I would say that becoming an advisor of a faculty member at CDC is probably the, the, the most common way in which people do join the collective, but it is not the only way. Uh, there are many people who have joined the collective uh, um, uh, without, uh, um, through other paths as well. Yeah, um, we, should, we should shift gears and go to the breakouts. I want to mention one other thing before we do, which is that there's another slide in that slide deck, which points to um, the not so obvious frequently asked questions uh, etherpad assembled by several current and recent members of the group. Um, and this is another thing that's worth checking out. Um, you know, uh, in, if, if, you're, if you've got questions on your mind or you're curious, what questions do current and recent students wish they had asked or that, you know, they think people ought to understand before they, before they uh, try to get, get involved in this? 